Good afternoon. I'm Roger Pegram. I'm the Vice Chair of the Society of Evidence-Based Policing. It's great to have you with us this afternoon and welcome to the second session of our virtual conference, 10 Challenges to Policing. Um, this is our second virtual conference and I hope that next year we'll be able to meet again in person. Uh, however, it was great last week to see uh, our session drawing so much attention globally and having a far wider reach than we've ever had before. Um, it does seem an age ago since we were snowed in in Milton Keynes in 2018 due to the beast from the east, uh, as some of you will remember. Uh, the Society of Evidence-Based Policing is made up four police officers, uh, police staff and research professionals who want to improve policing from within by using the best available research evidence. Uh, our aims are to use, produce and communicate the best available research evidence in policing. Um, I encourage those of you online who've not yet joined the society to do so, uh, details are available on the website. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, I just wanted to tell you that there is a book that's come out um, today um, and I'm able to offer um, through the society a 30% off code for people who may want to purchase the book. If you can email the email address admin at sebp.police.uk um, the reason for this is it's not to go out on, on social media, the code it is only for delegates uh, and with us being virtual this year, uh, that's the best way of getting hold of a code and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy the book. Um, I'll now introduce today's speaker, uh, Professor Jason Roach. He's been a huge supporter of the Society of Evidence-Based Policing since its inception. Uh, he's the Professor of Psychology and Policing and also the Director for the Applied Criminology and Policing Centre at the University of Huddersfield. Um, Jason's also the editor-in-chief of the Policing Journal, and he's co-written three books with Professor Ken Pease, including Self-Selection Policing. Um, he's written over 30 book chapters, um, various policing topics, child homicide, criminal investigation, police decision-making, but more importantly, what he'll speak to us today about is um, nudge theory and the nudge approach to reducing crime and, and how that we can reduce crime and, and influence people. So uh, without further ado, thank you very much, Jason. Over to yourself. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Roger. You must have really heard. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, nudge and I'm going to talk about um, influencing people. But first, I, I, I was a bit apprehensive about going onto social media. Um, I'm not used to really going onto social media. Um, I thought that I might have to fall over or accidentally set fire to my pants or something to go onto social media. But apparently, it's a good platform now for real intellectual and intelligent debate, uh, and obviously me as well. So I'm now going to try and share my slides with you which hopefully will mean that you don't have to look at my face all the time um and uh where are we because i don't have to so i don't see why you should have to um i'm assuming that you can see my slides is that okay yes okay right so what am i talking about today i'm talking about moving beyond nudge i'm going to talk about nudge but um and and i'm sure many of you know what nudge is um and i'm going to go beyond that because i want to talk about influence okay i want to talk about how we influence people in terms of how do we influence people to reduce crime um is essentially what i'm talking about now i'm going to kind of uh, flash that quote at the top i was obsessed with the film flash gordon in 1980 um so i always try to start with that he only he, he started getting a bit loved up with dale arden um and she said that that's that's lovely flash i love you too but we only have 14 hours to save the earth and I like to think that I'm not getting loved up, but I like to think that I've got 40 minutes to save the earth. So these are my 40 minutes. Um, I'm going to suggest that crime prevention actually don't sound that sexy. OK, crime prevention as a term still sounds like locks and bolts and things and, and things that you do to things to stop them being stolen. And it's much, much, much bigger than that. So I'm going to suggest a little reframe. So. I'm going to call it the psychology of influence to reduce crime because it's more exciting. A bit like putting the word forensic in front of something it makes it a little bit more exciting, or it makes it sound exciting. <clears throat> be that psychology, uh, be that science, forensic science, be that accounting, forensic accounting. Maybe that one doesn't work, but I've seen it. But it, I'm trying to make it a little bit more exciting. Uh, why am I doing that? Because I think that um, crime prevention, well, we're talking about the 10 challenges for policing. Crime prevention, pillion principle number one, is still an incredible challenge, particularly as we're moving, a lot of crime is moving onto the internet. 
how do we think about being able to prevent crime on the internet? Um, I'm also going to talk start and we'll start off with things like situational crime prevention um, and how they influence offender decision making, um, particularly around reducing opportunities so that offenders don't perceive opportunities for crime. I'm going to talk about nudge, which is more subtle, kind of a little bit more of a subtle version of SCP, really, but it's slightly different. I'll talk about that and how we might use it to influence people, not just would be offenders or those that may offend because the opportunity is there, but those that may be come, uh, you know, victims of crime, all of us, basically. How can we be nudged or influenced uh, to, to take a little bit more care about things and to actually, you know, begin to think about um, how we can prevent crime? And I'll talk about some other facets of psychology. Uh, flicking through a, an old psychology textbook, I found all these things. I thought, well, they've just kind of lost, uh, um, they, they, you know, they're not as common now. They're not as kind of, kind of uh, popular. So I'm going to try and bring a couple of little bits of psychology back into it about influence and why I think they could fit into a nice influencing crime prevention agenda. OK, so psychology and influence. OK, so influence is where we affect or change someone or something in an indirect, but usually an important way. OK, persuasion is part of influence. And that's about how we get people to slightly believe in something else or we encourage them to believe in something. My little fish there. For some reason, I've gone with lots of fish analogies throughout this presentation. Maybe it's my surname. I don't know. But there you go. My little fish there going against the rest of the shoal going in the opposite direction, okay? Now, peer pressure, of course, is one of the greatest uh, influences. Um, anyone with children will tell you, um, and, you know, me you feel better experience, that if you want your children to do anything that you want them to do, then get another child to tell them, because uh, they'll, they'll listen to them far more than they will ever listen to, uh, to you know, to anyone else. Um, and there's a lot of influence out there at the moment, and a lot of it's negative. And a lot of it, sort of the myths around COVID vaccinations, for example. Um, my favourite one being that it has a transmitter device in it so that the police can tell where you are at any one given time. Um, if, only, if only that technology existed. Um, and um, But it is, and there's lots of influences out there that aren't good, and there's lots of influences that are we can use for the good. Uh, lots of techniques for influencing is what I'm saying. Um, we'll start off with the situational crime prevention, Cornish and Clark, and their 25 techniques. So, you know, much of it is about modifying environments and situations to reduce the opportunity that they, you know, they may omit to someone to commit crime. So much of it used to be about just nuts and bolts and, and, and kind of putting things, you know, making things target hardening. So my ATM machine there, my cash point there is a great big, you know, the chain around it um, to, to try and keep people from, from stealing it. Um, now, increasing the effort, that would be, okay, making it more difficult. I mean, it's pathetic, really. Anyone could get the chain off. In fact, I was at a part of a, a, a panel uh, a little while ago that was looking into ATM theft. So thefts from ATMs and actually thefts of the machines themselves. The people were getting JCBs or heavy plant machinery and they were digging out, um, you know, out of the wall. Uh, a, a, a cash machine and and having it you know getting away with it and I was talking to lots of people that are around this table and many of them from the industry from the from the ATM industry and from um, sort of cash kind of delivery industries and they were all still fixated on 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 making it more difficult at the point of the crime or potential point of the crime making it difficult for them to steal and to get into these machines. And they said, well, how are they getting the machines out of the wall? Well, they're using heavy plant machinery. Well, shouldn't we be looking at how to make it more difficult to steal heavy plant machinery, perhaps? And I thought that was a good idea, but it wasn't kind of what they were, you know, their field. So increasing the effort and target hardening is still very much, um, you know, the default position, if you like, of trying to make, to prevent crime, particularly of a theft nature. Then there's increasing the risk, so making it more risky, of course, so that people will think twice before they do it because there's a good chance they get caught, possibly because there's a great big CCTV camera just above the ATM. Um, reduce the rewards, so make it not worth it, basically, so that you know there's no point in me getting into that ATM because if I do, it will trigger a mechanism by which this indelible ink is fired all over the money, making it absolutely worthless. So why would I do that? And then reducing the provocation, so reducing the kind of the you know things that may provoke people into committing some kind of uh, of crime, and then removing the excuses, so neutralising okay people's 
what neutralizing the neutralization if you like uh, as criminologists call it so that's about kind of neutralizing the excuses we can give ourselves for committing a crime so if i'm a burglar for example um then i'm not bothered about breaking into your house um because you're insured and you'll get your stuff back these are all techniques for manipulating situations and trying to make them more difficult um, and influencing basically a potential offender from actually committing the crime. Nudging is a little bit more subtle than that, okay? So for example, this happens regularly and um, before COVID when you could go to shops, um, if you can remember, um, it, I'm sure this has happened to many people out there. It happens to me on a regular basis and it drives me mad, um, which is why I'm at the risk of being banned from many a shop. And that is you go to the, the, the cash point, the, the, sorry, to the till, and you give them your goods and they say that will just be £1.50 or that will just be $1.32, whatever. Yeah. The insertion of that little word, just, uh, that's a nudge. That's making you think that you're getting a good deal. Probably not. You know, the sweets or whatever you were buying were probably the same the day before and they will be the same price the next day. But it makes you feel better. Now, it's not saying come back to this shop or else but it is nudging you into thinking, well, I've got a good deal, so I'm probably going to come back here. Um, those of the, that live in the UK, we were plagued for years by adverts by the DFS, Dining, dining Room Furniture Specialists, okay? Every advert. Now, the point I'm making here and other furniture specialists are available uh, before I cause any trouble. Um, they always said the sale must end Sunday. Now, that didn't, that was a nudge in the sense that only if you were thinking about getting a new sofa, OK. And uh, would that nudge you into thinking, well, I better go there and have a look at their, what they've got to offer before Sunday because the sale's got to end Sunday. It wouldn't nudge someone who didn't want to know. So it would just go completely over their head. So, so slightly different, more subtle. Um, they never did say which Sunday it was, of course. Um, I, I, you know, and they probably still don't. But, you know, it was enough to nudge some people to go and have a look before Sunday because that's when the sale ends. Now, nudge originates from Tyler and Sunstein and their work, the behavioral economists. Um, and it's around, you know, sort of extenuating some choices. So getting influencing people's decision making very subtly without kind of giving them binary choices. So, you know, you choose the most pro-social option and we won't argue about what pro-social means. And we won't argue about what liberal paternalism means because those have been accused of, you know, what is pro-social and who's making us do it. But for example, leaving your organs behind should you die for, for somebody else's for transplant. OK, most people would agree with that. Um, but the system used to be that you had to sign a form to say, yes, I agree with that. Please do that. Now you have to sign a form to opt out. Now, the option is still there to give or not to give, uh, to, you know, at the risk of sounding like Shakespeare, but um, it's still there, but it's changed around. So most people just go along with it. OK, so the choices haven't changed. It's just the order of the choices, if you like. It's akin to having a list of, of words and putting one in bold. Uh, you could choose the other words, but the one in bold sticks out. Now, this is based very much on Kahneman Tversky's work, OK, um, uh, around kind of how we make decisions. So there's system one decision making, which is fast and conscious. We tend to use that very quickly. Fight or flight flame, uh, a lot of that is, um, you know, we don't have time to make a decision, just act, get out of there. Uh, and system two is the more rational kind of um, deliberating uh, sort of facility that we have in order to think about things and to question things. OK, the problem is, of course, there aren't enough hours in the day to just engage system two all the time. You, you literally wouldn't get out of bed. We need to act fast. We need to, in occasion, come up with things uh, very quickly. And that's what nudge taps into. It taps into a lot of the unconscious thinking. OK, before we've even deliberated something. Um, I'll give you a quick example uh, in terms of crime. Uh, many years ago, when I first started working with the police, there was a particular um, taxi area, uh, taxi rank area in Blackpool that was notorious for, for fighting on a Friday night, people falling out, queuing for cabs or not queuing for cabs. Um, and we went along and had a look and there wasn't any kind of, we're British, we need some, we need to queue. There wasn't any, any obvious point where the queue could be. So the police officer put a cone on the pavement, okay, and everybody started queuing and actual uh, you know, altercations at that taxi rank went down purely because there was this cone. Now, people weren't thinking about the cone. It was unconscious. They saw the cone and they just queued up. They saw a queue that just queued up. OK, um, and that's kind of the level of, of where nudge comes in. Now, what's the difference between situational crime prevention and nudge? Well, I'm trying to give you this in, in a sense of a sign. OK, so 
keep off the grass is very much a situational crime prevention um sign you know it, it's don't do it get off the grass don't care who you are keep off the grass okay now a nudge if we were particularly focusing on a well nudge is about particular particular groups of people you don't it's not about everybody it's about a particular group that you want to influence so say children then you might want to use this sign do not disturb tiny grass is dreaming okay children will go for that they might say oh i don't want to upset the little grass it's dreaming it's asleep and people like me are a bit kind of crazy will probably go I, I don't really want to uh, upset the grass and it you know not walk on the grass that's not going to stop your your avid kind of criminal grass trodder they will carry on but for a lot of people that is enough of a nudge to make them think i shouldn't go on that grass now i've borrowed this from the behavioral insights team okay and on their website and they have all different ways that we can influence other people other people's behaviors the first one is at, at the messenger so you know the messenger is important so not just the message but who delivers it um and uh, uh, you know again peer pressure so so if you've got a message that you want to give to, to, to youngsters to teenagers get another teenager to front it up um incentives as well positive reinforcement we all know that we can positive give positive reinforcement then people will do things norms okay whatever that is people we don't like like my little fish um he's swimming against all the other fish um that's not the norm and um, he's probably going to spin around at some point because norms get you in the end whatever it, most people do we tend to fit in we don't want to stand out default positions as well okay so there are certain things in the hard wired in our brains that we act in and to think in certain ways because they've been there for evolutionary design so if, so you know so for example we are loss averse far more loss averse we don't want to lose things than we are motivated to gain more we really don't want to lose what we've got okay which is why most of us don't gamble salience okay so we also like novel things as well so if you can present something as novel perhaps you're the first person to think about this you're the first person to do this then we quite like that because that panders to the to the last one on their ego as well like particularly if you're a man um you know most most women will, will, will know already that if you can convince a man that it was his idea in the first place he's more likely to do it you know affecting the ego commitments so if someone's vaguely committed yes i think that you know um, organ donation is a good thing then of course they will then begin to to kind of the behavior should follow that affects never ever make a decision when you're either very low in mood or very high in mood because it won't work out it won't end well okay um and priming i'm going to talk about priming in a minute so i'm, I'm going to move on to the next one now what a nudge what the nudge in terms of preventing crime how might it be applied to crime prevention and i've unpublished this because i keep changing my mind about it but i'm going to share it with you as some kind of a work in progress First of all, all nudges must be subtle. They must be nuanced, sorry, they must be subtle. It's not about trying to change everybody in the whole community, in the whole country. It's about starting to change certain people, okay, and target them, not necessarily for bad things, but uh, I'll give you some examples in a minute, but you know, one size fits all, nudge doesn't suit, okay? Um, they have to be tailored to the people that you want to nudge. Unconscious as well, nudges tap into existing bias, as I said before. Um, talking about kind of the behavioral insights team kind of list there are biases one of them is we like to go with the grain we like to go with the flow so if you can present a nudge as going with the flow we're more likely to go with it nudges should target those on the cusp of choosing the pro-social option so it's not going to nudge the most ardent criminal in the world not to go on your grass okay not going to happen if they disregard the law at a very low at a high level they'll probably disregard it at a low level um and um it's those that are you know are quite law abiding that you're trying to stop walking on the grass give people a choice don't take it away from them um you know they can still choose whatever it is but make it less attractive is what nudging is or make another one more pro-social more attractive they need to be easy you need to explain them uh they need to be explainable and they need to be easy to implement um because if not people a nudge isn't going to work it's too complex and here's the one that police love the most, which is why I don't think nudging, uh, why I can't believe nudging hasn't really, really taken off in crime prevention over here, is that they've got to be cheap. OK, they've got to be cheap. They're little intervention. I'll give you some examples in a minute. They're not great big £500,000 worth of CCTV equipment. Um, they are about little tiny manipulations of, of, of kind of choices in order to get people to, to, to pick the one that's the most pro-social. And they've got to be testable. How do we know if they work or not? OK, we can't just, you know, walk away. Uh, and say yeah that worked i think we need to test them properly which is where evidence base comes in of course 
Okay, so um, about a year ago, 18 months ago, I was working with Durham Police and they were having a lot of cars um, that were having things taken from them overnight, um, uh, theft basically, theft from, from motor vehicles, um, that they found that a lot of the cars that were being victimised were left open, they were unlocked overnight, okay. So I said to a police officer, well, what, what would you ordinarily do about trying to get people to, you know, take more care and to zap the zapper, if you like, uh, of a night time. Because it was easily done. I spoke to some people in the area and they, you know, they said that they'd, um, you know, come home from school, the kids were shouting in the background, in the back of the car, sorry, and that they, you know, and they just got them out of the car and they just, they just forgot to lock it. Okay, that's it. Um, and how do you nudge people like that? You know, how do you get people to, to take more? And the police officer said, well, we've got, we've got these leaflets uh, and we put them through the letterbox. Uh, along this, this isn't them, but along this line of lock it or lose it and keep calm, stop theft, you know, make sure that you lock your car or you'll lose your stuff kind of thing. And I said to him, well, did they work? The, you know, did, did it work? And he said, well, it doesn't really matter. He said, because we've got a shed full of them um, until they're gone. We, you know, what we're going to do? That isn't evidence based policing as far as I know it. OK, that is getting rid of lots of pieces of paper that you've paid to have printed. So. What was this? What was this, the, the area? We looked at the areas and I'm using the right terminology for evidence based policemen, treatment and control groups. Um, and you'll see there that uh, quite a large percentage of cars that had things taken from them in these four areas were left insecure. OK, um, you know, between four, 32 percent and 70 percent of them. So th this was a rich area in which to try a few nudges to see if we could get people to be more, um, you know, more careful about locking their cars um and it was quite a nice area of, of durham this one so we thought that people might actually kind of um you know you know might, might listen to, to to a message uh in, in terms of kind of you know uh, you know a leaflet basically if we could give them a leaflet would they read it maybe good chance they would read it ask some people and uh, but the problem is of course that the first thing you're leafleting people about them you know trying to nudge them into being more security conscious is that it falls through the mailbox stroke letterbox onto the mat and uh, onto the, uh, and then it goes straight in the green bin unless you can get their attention and i think the the, the stroke of genius that came to us was was the well we'll put a picture of their street on it and so it, hopefully if it falls the right way around they will see their street and that will grab their attention. They'll begin to read it. And then we stand some chance of whatever we put in it as a message of nudging them into thinking about making sure that the car's locked before they go to bed, for example. Um, and a lot of the time, I've got time to go into it, but a lot of the terminology here uh, was actually well, very well thought out from an evolutionary psychology perspective. And that was about, you, you know, don't make it easy for other people to take your things, pushing on the loss averse buttons um pushing on that looking after your kids stuff the parental buttons there's a lot going on in these leaflets and if anyone would like to see them i'm, I'm more than happy to send them to them so did it have an effect then well as you can see there it did okay so in the three of in the uh three areas before so the four areas um three of them uh i'll come back to three of them in a minute three of them saw a reduction so in the two treatment areas the reduction of 33 percent and there was another one in the weird valley treatment area of 25 percent which is good, yeah, for the price of a leaflet and a bit of police time in distributing the leaflets. I think they were police cadets, actually, so there weren't actually, there wasn't actually police time, um, which was good. But I mean, the control group, which you, you hate it when you're doing some kind of trial and the control also goes down, but that's wedged in between the two treatment groups. So I'm thinking, I'm, I'm reasoning that one away by using the diffusion of benefits kind of explanation in that you know, it had an effect because these places were too close, whereas the third control group was further away and actually saw an increase of 69% in, in deaths from motor vehicles that were insecure. So cheap, easy to understand, and at least in the short term had an effect. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't kid you now and say it still had an effect now. Maybe it hasn't. People have gone back to their usual kind of ways of forgetting to lock the car. But at that time, it did have an effect. Now, if that had failed, what would I have done about it? And then this is where um, sometimes I worry a little bit about evidence policing and the kind of press that it gives out. And I don't think it's right, but the, the perceptions that people have of evidence-based policing. Sorry, Roger, I had to get this one in. Perceived failure is not always total. So don't be scared to fail, particularly with nudges. If it doesn't work, modify it, bin it if you have to, but you haven't spent that much money anyway or resources on it, so it doesn't really matter, okay? But perceived failure is usually not down to the idea 
So it's not the idea that you've got in order to try and reduce crime, okay, or a particular crime, but the way that you've implemented it. So it might be that, for example, you are trying to uh, leaflet an area about reducing crime when really a text message or something on social media would have been better as a messenger because the demographic of that area is, is younger than 30, for example, uh, and they will pick things up on social media rather than read thing, anything that comes through the letterbox. Common misperceptions of evidence-based policing is also, I think, in some respects, discouraging good ideas because... And I've uh, these are genuine. I've spoke to some police officers about evidence-based policing and, and why they don't go forward with some really good ideas. And the first one is my idea might be considered stupid. Well, very few ideas are stupid. Maybe a bit silly. Ken Pisa tell you that I'm forever bombarding him with my uh, my with my ideas. Some stick, some don't. Um, sorry for those of you. Ken Pease is uh, my research assistant has been for a while, but other people refer to him as Professor Ken Pease OBE for some reason. But there you go. What if it fails? OK, is it my career over? Uh, I doubt it. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, you know, this is this is research. This is what I, people have told me, uh, police officers. I will need a massive data set. Well, you may do and you may not. OK, you've got to start somewhere. Here's an inside piece of information from academics, researchers. OK, if you do something small scale, call it a pilot, covers a multitude of sins. It will take too much time and resources. Well, with it. I don't know if it's a nudge based one, it shouldn't do it, you know, leaflet, whatever it is, um, a poster, whatever it is, it shouldn't do at all. And the last one, I'll need an, a randomized controlled trial. and I don't know what one is or how to do one. Well, I think if I was going to nudge evidence based policing, it would be around try to dispel this myth. I don't it's not you're not, you're not perpetuating it, but people are still perceiving it. OK, in the wrong way. Um, which, uh, which, I, which I think is important. Um, and while I've got it, while I remember it, how many evidence-based policing members does it take to change a light bulb? Between 0 0.01 and 0 0.05 depends on how significant you want that change to be. If that joke worked, let me know and I'll use it again. If not, we'll let it go. Okay, another kind of nudge type thing was the Bedeval Insights team did something called writing on the wall, where they got a bit of prose, uh, where well, they got a a defender to write a bit of prose that basically says things like, uh, don't do it, you know, I regret it, etc., etc., in a police cell so that people that were in there would read it and it may well have an effect on their thinking and then consequently, hopefully, on their um, behaviour, i.e. not offending. And they did this on a massive scale across, uh, across London. I forget the figures, but it was thousands and thousands of people that were in these, these cells. And of course, other cells were the control ones that had nothing on them. Although if you look at police cells, um, I, I spend a lot of time in them legitimately, you will see that the only thing they really have on them is the Crime Stoppers number, okay? Um, the first thing police do obviously is take your phone off you when you go into a police cell. So unless you've committed that to memory, um, that's, that's kind of a waste of time. I was in a police cell, looking at the police cells and I thought that this was, and advertisers would, would pay good money to put things on police cell walls because they want to influence people. Um, why are we not doing the same? Well, this didn't, according to the BIT uh, study, it didn't work. It didn't kind of, there was no discernible difference in terms of people's behaviour that had been in these cells and those that hadn't um, in terms of reoffending. So they concluded that perhaps I'm um, putting words in their mouth that it was a rubbish idea. Well, I don't think it was a rubbish idea because it was mine in the first place and they got hold of it by various means. But anyway, so I didn't I didn't think that was a rubbish idea. I thought what had happened was it was implementation problem there. I think they leaped too far. I think that perhaps they needed to see whether people would take notice of any message that was on the wall before, you know, they would actually see it. Because uh, sometimes if you're in a, even if you're in a cell for seven hours, you know, you know, you don't you don't tune in on whatever's around you. You don't bother. Yeah. So I think we needed a step back. So we did a small scale trial in one police station, okay, in County Durham. Um, and I just wanted to see if the people that had been in there noticed anything different about it and had read actually what was on the wall. Um, and I came up with a kind of message that's kind of domestic abuse, domestic violence kind of orientated in about thinking about what you've done. And that was only in four of the 14 cells, OK, um, of which 10 were kind of regularly used on a Friday and Saturday night, never full capacity 14. 
Simple question at the interview, they were then asked afterwards that had been in any of the cells, and that was, did you notice anything memorable about your cell? And we're still looking at the data, but overwhelmingly, 95% of those that were in the cells with the writing on the wall said, yeah, I did. There was a funny message on there. Um, you know, uh, it kind of got to me a little bit. Um, can't tell you yet if their behaviour changed, but at least we know that they kind of noticed it. Um, and I revised my hypothesis when we know, you know, exactly um, what happened afterwards. This is what we've put. You see that it's all very questions. Of course, people have to be screened for mental health problems first. We can put them in a, this, this, you know, this could have catastrophic effects. Um, and change can start, but don't, so it can start now. Don't be afraid to ask, was actually at the threshold of the door as people walked out of the cell. Uh, and one person did actually refer themselves to check one and said, yeah, I needed, I've been needing, meaning to do something about my kind of my drugs uh, abuse and taking. Um, and this has kind of helped me and, and kind of, you know, convinced me that I need to do something about it, which was, you know, brilliant. If it helped one for the cost of a 30 quid stencil, it's got to be worth it. Yeah. The thing about nudging as well is, um, and the thing about crime prevention in general is, it, it tends to be one hit wonders. It tends to be one go at something and then you move away. Well, why? Okay. So I put a nudge in for my promo for this talk that I did last week. Look at me, promo, we get an agent next. Promo. Eh? Sounds good, doesn't it? Anyway, incremental influence is what I'm talking about. I said nudge snooker, and snooker's the analogy. I, as far as I know, there isn't a snooker player that goes up the snooker table, whacks the balls, and expects all of them to go in. Yeah, might do that at pool, but not snooker. It's a game of strategy, and you have to put the white in the right place. You have to position all the balls. And sometimes I think crime, re crime prevention, crime reduction, and nudging are, are similar to that. Okay, you need to get people into the right place before you can hit them. Perhaps the last nudge that will make them change their behaviour. And I suppose the best analogy I can give you of that is the Twelve Steps to Recovery program that's used by Alcoholics Anonymous with people that have alcohol abuse problems. It's not called the One Step recovery approach where stop drinking or else yeah it's 12 gradual steps and i think we need to start thinking about influencing people in terms of reducing crime preventing crime in more gradual ways so little steps rather than one great big step okay um and and i think that's you know that's really important oh by the way i'm, I'm uh, you know lockdown and everything like that i think there's lots of people like me that have become over over familiar with wine OK, on a regular basis. Um, and I'm coming up with a 12 step program. I've only got three steps at the moment. The first one is um, cancel your monthly subscription to Naked Wines. The second one is take that app off your phone that tells you all about the wines if you scan the bottle. Uh, OK. And, and, and the third one is stop telling yourself that you need to drink because um, the kids are at home all the time because they're not. They've gone back to school. So that's my three points. So I'll, I'll work on the other nine. Affordance is another psychological concept, I think, that uh, that has important connotations for influencing people. So you look at my door push and pull signs there. You don't need the, the, the words on them. You know that if you come up to a door and it's got a plate on it, you push it. Yeah. And if it's got a handle, you pull it. Those two objects, if you like, they afford an action. And uh, Ken, please, I uh, mentioned him before, so I'm not going to mention him again puts it much more eloquently than me and is said what we need to understand is yes there are opportunities for crime but we need to understand how some people perceive them recognize them and other people don't um so affordance is actually a perception of a criminal opportunity in this context with a criminal action and i've spent quite a lot of time at least before lockdown when you could get into prison it's actually easier to get out of prison than it is to get in at the moment talking to you know what is it about cars, for example, that affords that they should be broken into or taken? What is it that they're looking for? Yeah, that the rest of us probably aren't. Um, and affordance is important in crime. Here's another example, baseball bats. OK, I tried to get an angle on how many baseball bats are sold uh, uh, in this country, in the UK. And it's over a hundred and something thousand. OK, but nobody plays baseball. What are they using them for? Well, baseball bats are yeah, afford a weapon, don't they? Um, and the internet, when it was, you know, in its first days, I, I'm convinced that people thought that that was only going to be used for really good reasons, really good purposes. Nobody was going to use it for crime or anything nefarious whatsoever. And of course, they they do. The internet now is where a lot of crime is moving, which is where crime prevention needs to move. Um, but opportunities are only opportunities if you recognise them as such, if they afford themselves 
um, as opportunities. And I think we need to understand how that happens and how people perceive these opportunities if we're to make big inroads and advancements in, in trying to prevent crime on the internet. Because the internet facilitates crime of an old types of crime like theft and fraud, etc. But it's also brought with it new types of crime, new opportunities to commit new types of crime like fishing, etc. With a PH. Um, Priming is another one. That's interesting. Um, exposure to one stimulus influences a response to a subsequent stimulus. There was a wonderful set of, you know, a very simple experiment they used to do, I think, was an undergraduate, was that if you give people, you, you talk about doctors to people and the medical profession, and you give them a list of words, of uh, 50 words, they will pick the word nurse out straight away. It'll just leap off the page because you've, you've primed them. Uh, talking about doctors in the medical profession. Anyone who's got a fiesta, well, there are about 1.6 million fiestas in the UK, okay? Now, um, why am I telling you that? Well, there's a lot of fiestas. I've just told you that there's a lot of fiestas, 1.6 million. It's the most popular car in the country. Um, and I guarantee now that when you're driving home, if you haven't got a fiesta, you'll notice every flaming fiesta on the road because that idiot told me that that's the most popular, and it is, yeah? And uh, don't worry, if you do have intrusive thoughts around that nature, then give me a call and I can help you remove them for a small fee. Priming without realising then. So another thing that uh, operation that I've, I've done um, with various police forces is around student burglaries or student victimisation in terms of burglary. That's where students have been victims of burglary. And quite often it's because they leave the door open or uh, the door unlocked or the windows open because they live in multi-occupancy housing quite a lot and usually in quite high crime areas. Um, and they probably going back to when I was a student, you just assume that somebody else is in the house and you just shut the door, you don't take much much uh, notice. Um, and also those that come out of halls of residence have had all the security done for them. And so when they move in the second year into a house, into the real world, they ain't got the right kind of um, methods or even awareness of what's going on, maybe until it's too late. So I always like to know as much about the people that we're trying to nudge as possible. So on two, three occasions now, three different police forces in their most you know, victimised student areas in terms of burglary, have gone out with a survey um, asking questions about the people that live there. So the questions around kind of what university you go to, are you insured? I inserted a couple of nudges like, uh, do you know that if you uh, leave the door open or the windows open, then your insurance company is likely to deem you negligent and so won't pay out when you, if you get your things taken. And also, do you know that you live in one of the 12 most burglarised streets in whatever city it is. A few nudges around that. I didn't think they would have much effect, but the information it was collecting we could then use to do nudges uh, to come up with nudges for specific, you know, types of student, if you like, or uh, people. Well, it did have an effect. Just purely asking questions had an effect, okay? Um, and, it, you know, it compared, to, so when the um, the surveys were being done, this one was in Durham, um, in the months that it was done, we compared it with the same months for the previous two years, and there was a big reduction in 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 insecure burglaries because you know but that also may of course i admit that also those that do the burglarizing probably lived in that area as well and and, and there was a police presence and thought well we won't we won't go there for a while so either way it had a reductive effect is what i'm saying for a relatively small um outlet um uh, cost uh, and it's the priming effect you know something's coming something's coming we came up with some of these. This is just a couple of the leaflets that we come up with. So, you know, I'm trying to appeal to some students by getting them into the habit, mm, semi family maybe, get them to check their doors and windows. This one, um, you know, the more those who think they're more intellectual type of student, then perhaps the brain, you know, don't so flex it before you exit. I've said this and I'll say it again. If I'd come up with flex it before you Brexit, then the outcome might have been slightly different. Priming against organised crime, or prime against crime, that's, got a, that's a good title for a paper, isn't it? I think we're going to have that one. What a slogan. Um, priming. Okay, Ken, one of the things, Ken, he keeps putting things my way that were written thousands of years ago. I don't know why, it must be an age thing. Um, but at the moment, it's uh, Sun Tzu's Art of War, which isn't about how to wage war. It's how, how to win, but with, with kind of uh, being least aggressive as you possibly can. So it's about being deceptive or giving the wrong impression to your enemy. So you appear weak when you are strong and you're strong when you are weak. Organised crime groups and policing. 
Yeah. Um, I can't help thinking that the dark side of nudging could be used there where you give some kind of impression that you have more resources and you have more power, okay, uh, behind firepower, whatever you want to call it, behind you than you do in order to influence the decision making of the organized crime groups. So the fish there, I told you there's a lot of fish in this. The two fish are the same size, but that one in the little bowl was magnified, okay, and I'm wondering, I'll leave that for sort of the police officers amongst you to ponder whether you use those kind of tactics and you know uh, I, I don't i won't go into the ethics of it all because ethics quite often get in the way of good research lastly i'm going to talk about locus of control okay and this is a very simple concept but it's very important to to kind of understanding crime prevention and why some people engage with it and some people don't now if i have a very strong internal locus of control it means that i have a lot of i feel like i've got a lot of control over my own destiny okay so that i can reduce my chances of becoming a victim of crime okay um by doing certain things they're within my gift within my power now if i have a strong external locus of control personality features these are then um you know uh, it doesn't matter what i do i live in a high crime area no matter what i do the chances of me being a becoming a victim of crime are quite high what we need to do is we need to to to, to you know bring people into the middle there if you like in terms of crime prevention so they're not running around with gay abandon thinking that everything's in their power and they're not going to become a victim of crime nor are they crippled with kind of inertia and not doing anything because what's the point you know there are things we can do and you know to some extent we need to give back control now why do i think that's important i'll leave you with this because i think it's really important not just because i come up with another flaming acronym but there you go but one of the uh, accusations always levied at, vic uh, at uh, crime prevention is that it blames victims. Now, I can see how that is the case and can be the case with domestic abuse or whatever. You, yeah. Um, I don't see that so clearly with burglary or something like that. We're not we're trying to help people not become victims or not to become a victim again of burglary, for example. So I've come up with this little acronym to try and you know, help us to think about how we might move the locus of control perhaps yeah um towards more of a an internal one with people without scaring them and without blaming them in terms of crime prevention first one's reassurance tell the potential victims they're not being personally singled out they're not they're part of a demographic group they live in an area that's a hot spot for example or it's because they live alone it's not because they are jason roach who lives in number whatever you, yeah reassure them i think that needs to come in we need we, we need to reframe it as empowering people so they you know they can take more control over um sort of their lives and, and kind of their crime uh, and crime prevention um to better protect themselves and their families and their possessions we're not about we're not blaming them we're trying to empower them um and our you know ask a sample of potential victims whether the crime prevention before you do it makes sense there's a priming effect there if they think it makes sense then they're ready for it when it comes they're more likely to engage in it okay react is the acronym carefully explain if and when asked by potential victims why this kind of intervention is being used we didn't do that in manchester with students um, and my friend fiona who hopefully is watching this will bear me out on this we came up with we, we the police went out and did the uh, the survey uh, and that caused a little bit of furore on, on Facebook, et cetera, because people, students were worrying about, well, why are we being asked all these questions? Is there something we should know? Have there been 15 burglars just been released from local prison that are coming our way? We should have carefully explained it to them first. We're well, not in so much as to prime them completely, but to let them know that something's coming um, and then it wouldn't have shocked them. Um, you know, it's because it's a high, right, a high burglary area. That's why, uh, not because of some idiot at university who thinks it's a good idea to try and do an experiment and tell the potential victims afterwards how many crime prevention initiatives um there's no feedback people aren't told whether it worked why it didn't work etc we need to as part of the empowerment we need to start talking to them afterwards and saying well this is what happened look at the look at the figures how do you feel etc okay so that's me done now so i should remember to stop sharing and any questions about any of that then please do contact me give me an hour or so after this to have a lie down but please do contact me and i hope that you know it's made some inroads into my uh trying to help with us um meet one of the 10 policing challenges 
No, Jason, thank you so much. Um, absolutely fantastic, really interesting presentation. I'm sure there will be lots of questions coming in thick and fast. Uh, and the first one from Pepsi and Doritos. What an interesting <laughs> name that is. But um, what about scripted dialogue that police officers could use nudge drivers that have been speeding? Um, might this work in reducing speeding in the future? Now, I know there's been um, some stuff with the Behavioural Insights team around that, but Jason, your thoughts on that? Um, yes, um, but I, I go away from, and I do call the Behavioural Insights team sometimes on this, to their face, is mm. that there is a danger of, if you have a one size, one scripted piece of work, a piece of prose, that it only fits with some people that you stop and not everybody. So I would advocate having various different scripts that you can use that say the same thing, but in slightly different ways according to the person that you've just stopped. Yeah, I mean, I, there's been uh, pieces of le legitimacy research yeah. that we've done um, around officers in Australia wearing sunglasses or not wearing sunglasses when yeah. they, they, they were interacting. Equally, the, the notice of intended prosecution um, study. So um, for sort of in England and Wales policing, really old Victorian style language included in the letters that went out. Uh, West Midlands yeah. Police um, changed that and, and had some good results in, in, in terms of um, payments uh, yeah. and people stopping um, doing that. So really, yeah. really great question. Just reminds me of my, my good friend uh, and the, the legend that still is, but that was uh, Mike Barton, Chief Constable of Durham, uh, when he used to send out Christmas cards to all the offenders on his patch saying have a good Christmas uh, to nudge them into, you know, to, to be reminded that, that the police are there. I always wanted him to send out a Star Wars type Christmas card with may the force be with you, but he never let me do that. But um, he was more generic. I was more targeted. Um, I think quite often we forget about that way nudge. We still think that one nudge will fit everybody when that isn't what nudging is about. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Have we got any more questions? Where we go, wouldn't it encourage graffiti? That's probably in relation to the prison cell or the, the jail cell. Um, I hadn't really, thought, really thought about that. Um, yeah, yeah it, it could do, I suppose, but you know. They'd have to get well, through custody with, yeah, <laughs> getting through custody with marker pens and whatever. But uh, just on that, in terms of the cell messaging, it was on the walls, wasn't it? I'm just conscious. A lot of um, a lot of uh, people in in there will be on the back lying down. And um, was ever yeah. put, put to put it on the ceiling? Yeah, I did. I asked. I we we did we did, uh, and it wasn't for for more um, aesthetic reasons. Um, it was hard enough trying to get somebody to say yes that we could put anything on the walls. To be quite honest, because of the worry that it, it may have an adverse influence on someone. Um, but yeah, of course, um, I, I know if some, um, we originally wanted to put some mirrors in there, not glass mirrors, but mirror kind of foil. Um, and it's very expensive and they got to the point where they was going to put it on the ceiling. So you look at yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. and, uh, but it got, it, it didn't get through at the last minute again for reasons of kind of mental health and, and what have you, you know. You know. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm sure you've got a little black book with tons of ideas, some of which you haven't been allowed to do as yet, and um, you'd be looking <laughs> for resources to partner up with. Now, if, if, if my little black book of ideas was ever found, I would spend a lot of time on a psychiatric ward, put it that way. No worries. We've got another, another question for you, uh, Jason. So um, may I ask another perhaps some related question, is there any literature relating to whether students with justice, criminology type qualifications experience policing differently? Um, I'm not aware of anything. Um, no. Is this, I, I don't understand is the question meaning about their experience of policing or their experience of, of, of kind of being in policing? I, I'm not sure. I think that as their experience of policing, um, I can say from a personal point of view, I mean, I, I joined policing with no qualifications um, other than four GCSEs and did my education as a serving police officer. And it certainly made me change my lens on, on how I view the criminal justice system and my role within the criminal justice system. 
Um, I think that was probably part of, of, of the reason and the thinking around some of the, the PEQF, um, the, the College of Policing and, and looking at, uh, you know, what they call the professionalization of policing and putting them um, qualifications out there. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not advocating that every police officer needs degrees far from it, but I think, um, you know, high, higher standards of education and getting some qualification for the already great work and whatever we do um, certainly changed my perspective on policing. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the question there about uh, do they experience a routine police citizen encounter differently? Some will, because some um, criminology students are quite, um, what's the word, reactionary in their, in their kind of outlook of the police, you know, sort of like critical criminology, which is, you know, which is fine. Um, and, um, and others aren't. I actually, I don't have, um, I don't do many undergraduate lessons anymore, lectures anymore, but when I did one a little while ago, I asked just a bunch of third year criminology students whether they knew what their rights were if they were arrested. None of them did, um, which you would assume <laughs> would be the, you know, motivated, um, that that would be what they did, but they didn't know, they didn't know what their rights were. So, you know, some do, some don't is an answer that to read Toe's question, I guess. Here we go. Next question from Sean. Um, in Leicestershire, 10 years ago, we dealt with well-known burglary nominals by having a police car outside for 10 minutes with just their picture in the front of the car on a document. Is that a nudge? Uh, thin line between nudge and shove. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. There's your answer, Sean. Um just, I've got a question myself around, you know, when you talk, speaking around the student burglaries, it's, it's more in line with uh, when they would be most vulnerable to victimisation. So uh, I've been thinking um, as part of, of my work around burglary in, in my current role, uh, coming out of COVID, students are going to start coming back in, in, into the universities. Um, as a first year student, you're placed in halls of residence, you're given tons of crime prevention advice, all the this, all this spiel, welcome to the university, but you are really well protected. Um, second year students, you're more knowledgeable, you're more comfortable with your surroundings, but you're no longer afforded that protection usually of, of halls of residence and you go into these houses of multiple occupancy that you speak of. Um, and it's just around that, that to me would seem like if we were targeting what years to actually do crime prevention advice with, it's, I'm not saying not to do it with first years, but, but absolutely around the refreshing and targeting around second years. I'd just be interested in your thoughts around that, Jason. Definitely, we were picking up, well, it was a hypothesis that was kind of substantiated and that, um, you know, crime prevention advice needs to be given to um, first years before they leave the halls of residence, so it becomes second nature to them. But then again, yeah, the risks, the risks change and the risks of forgetting stuff um, there needs to be some other kind of refreshing kind of way of, uh, you know, in the second year and in the third year. What tends to happen, though, I mean, I've done this with, in Le I live in Leeds and, and Leeds is Hyde Park, which everyone knows is the Burghley Capital Universe because there's so many students that live there. And what tends to know, what tends to be the pattern is that the, those that in the second year come out of their halls of residence and go for the really cheap accommodation with their mates, yeah? and there's a good chance that they're going to be victimized that's so over the third year they go somewhere where there's better security and it costs a bit more and you know in a nicer area so they're, they're kind of it's kind of a transient population in these areas which is uh which is kind of you know so you need to keep repeating whatever it is you do and not assume that it'll just you know it'll have an effect forever because the same people will live there on a, on a similar thing when i was talking about the nudge snooker type thing uh, car parks are a thing of mine. I like I like car parks because there's all sorts of things go on in them that you can try all sorts of things to try and uh, prevent them. And I was looking at a car park about a year ago that was a hospital car park that was getting cars broken into regularly. And yet the police officer that was talking to me said, oh, we know that they come on foot who commit it and they come down here. And so I said, well, why aren't we starting the nudging further up the journey? Why are we waiting until they get to the car park before we start to try and nudge them? So you could do like, I'm standing like bloody Darren Brown here, aren't I? But you could do really subtle kind of nudges to get, you know, to be able to build up to the last one, if you know what I mean. And I don't yeah. think we've explored that anywhere near enough with regards to burglary, with any kind of theft, to be quite honest. Right. Okay. No, it's um, really interesting. LJ Stevenson has got a question for you. Um, have you done any work with Nudge, etc., to change organisational culture? 
E.g., your example on changing the way people in policing see EBP? Well, you know, I was flattered for you to say that I was one of the main supporters of EBP. I've done my damnedest not to be, but there you go. Even I've had to comply like my little fish. Um, yeah, there is a bit of a selling job to do with EBP because it does assume, you know, um, randomised control trials or nothing. And, and, and I'm not saying that's right. That's just what I pick up talking to people out there. So it is a little bit of a repackaging job needed to, to do with the EBP movement. Um, I was asked once to um, by a rather senior officer um, to uh, try and encourage greater AMPR use by officers, particularly the data that it collects, um, which I was working on. And then um, he went he, he went to somewhere else to be a chief constable. Um, and um, as Ken calls it, the cubs were killed. OK, so I had a project that were left behind that wouldn't belong to the next person that came along. Um, was binned, so it never got anywhere. But that was the only time that I've ever been asked to kind of look at culture. I know that the Behavioural Insights team have, have kind of looked at recruitment, uh, increasing the diversity of recruitment in policing by using nudging, but um, that's as far as I got. Yeah, no, I mean, I, and that takes us on to um, another question for myself, really, around um, the marriage between problem-oriented policing and, um, and evidence-based policing, which... I very much view uh, as two sides of the same coin. Um, but yeah, I'd just be interested in your thoughts around that. I mean, most police forces are using the SARA or the OSARA mnemonic now. Um, sh you know, I would say that we should be looking towards evidence-based responses, um, in which case then problem-oriented policing and evidence-based policing, you know, it marries pretty well. But I'd be interested in your thoughts on how we could do that better or, or your thoughts on even if that well, is sides of the same coin yeah well definitely i mean if you've been around long enough like me now for 20 years in this business things come back round again and you assume that everybody knows about problem solving um and then someone will tell you about it oh it's brilliant this new thing called sarah and you think hang on a minute it's, it's almost as old as i am but great yeah um and i do my my problem i spoke at a conference uh, a couple of years ago about failure which was a bit worrying why they asked me to be a keynote on failure. But, you know, I took it on the chin. It was slightly less disturbing than being asked to talk at a paranoia concert uh, uh, conference. But there you are, go there. But, um, yeah, so I, I, I really think that police in particular and analysts and everybody else, they're really good at the first parts of SARA, the scanning and the analysis. And then the response bit, they just do what they would have done anyway if they're not done the scanning and analysis. I think that's where we need yeah. to nudge people into looking at what works or not being afraid to come up with something that, you know, is worth a try. So, I, yeah, I think we've got lazy on the response bit. That's where we need to work with Sarah. No, absolutely. And, um, it's a space that absolutely should be occupied by evidence-based policing, which is really brilliant. Um, we'll go with our last question now because time's running out on us. Ruby has asked, uh, how would you go about applying the react mnemonic you know uh, no victim blaming framework to crimes where the victim is not at fault such as domestic abuse or sexual offenses would you have to okay. turn it into um, target the likely um, perpetrators so that's the second um, part yeah. okay i'll do with the first part first um okay. the mnemonic that i've come up with it's not published anywhere yet um i'm still a work in progress and it's not a blame it's about not blaming anybody for whatever crime yeah, unless yeah. it's blatantly obvious, but no, no, not blaming anybody. So I'd answer that question by, I would treat everybody exactly the same. It's not about blaming people, it's about empowering people, yeah? And would you have to turn it on its head to target the likely perpetrators? Um, I hadn't thought about the perpetrators. Um, I get too preoccupied. I think we all do, don't we, with the perpetrators? We forget the, the people that are the potential victims. Um, and so I haven't really thought about it from a, the perpetrator's point of view, but it would tap in with, uh with with trying to neutralize well trying to reduce their ability to neutralize any guilt or any kind of uh you know um empathy with the people that they're committing the crimes against yeah no thank jason i'd like to thank you personally for coming on uh, and on behalf of the society of evidence-based policing and everyone who's watching either live time or, or watching it on catch up later on uh really fascinating it's great always to have you um supporting our conferences uh, really enjoyed today and um, thank you for joining us online wherever you are across the globe there's i've seen all kinds of people uh, popping up from all over the place which is fantastic 
next week, next Wednesday, um, day noon, British summertime, uh, we've got Superintendent Will Hodgkinson. Hodgkinson, there we go. It's coming up on the screen now, thanks. Um, so, yeah, he's going to be talking around domestic abuse and how we can protect effectively. Um, so, again, another great session to look forward to. Once again, thanks, Jason, and thanks to everyone. My pleasure. Speak to you all soon. Bye now. Thank you.